This continent of ours is a very old patch of dirt, but as a nation, we're brand new. In many ways, we're still uncovering some of our early history. I've been working for the last two or three years on a particular project about a Lieutenant Nixon. Way back in England in 1834, there was an article in an English newspaper that talked about him. And apparently, he was a member of a party that came in through Northern Australia and did an expedition right down into Central Australia. I'll read you what he found out, or what he claims he found out. He met down there a colony of Dutch people. Unfortunately, he could speak Dutch, and this is what he said. From a few expressions in Old Dutch which he uttered, I gathered some particulars namely that he belonged to a small community all as white as himself. He said about 300, that they lived in houses enclosed all together within a great wall to defend them from the black men, that their fathers came there about 170 years ago from a distant land across the great sea. Now, if this is true, that means we've got white settlement in Australia over a hundred years before the First Fleet. For a long time, we were taught that the British were the only white settlers of this country. But for me, the possibility of an earlier Dutch settlement changes everything. What got me started was an article in this newspaper, the Leeds Mercury, dated 1834. It was the largest provincial newspaper in England and often published reports of geographical exploration. On January the 25th, this extract from Lieutenant Nixon's journal appeared. Nixon's alleged discovery of a white colony was not on the northern shore, but 800 kilometers inland near the middle of the Tanami Desert in the Northern Territory. For me, the article raises so many unanswered questions. Who was Lieutenant Nixon? And what happened to his journal, which has never been found? What I find really fascinating about this Nixon report, if it's true, is the fact that it would tend to explain a whole bunch of things that were picked up in Central Australia last century. Things like John McDowell Stewart coming through there and he encountered an Aboriginal who gave him a Masonic sign. And then he found a footprint that he reckoned was white guy. And Charles Winnicky, he was another explorer poking around there. He encountered one day an Aboriginal who gave him the word, yeah, the yes. Strange stuff. According to Nixon, he was part of an expedition that sailed to Australia, to Coburg Peninsula, east of Darwin. In Nixon's day, there was no Darwin, but for years the British government had been trying to set up a permanent base along the northern coast. At Raffles Bay in 1827, they built a small outpost called Fort Wellington. It was their second attempt at a northern port, but it didn't last long. When Nixon's party arrived here on the 10th of April, 1832, Fort Wellington had been deserted for three years. Out there in the bay would have been the big ship which had just arrived from Singapore. And the men would have been ferried up this little cutting here. 
This cutting was put here because this is the site of the old abandoned Fort Wellington. And they cut it in there so that the boats could beach themselves and the stores could be unloaded. Nixon's mob would have used it as well. But the really interesting thing about the whole saga is the fact that it was totally secret. And here we are, 160 odd years later, trying to unravel the detail. The task of the expedition was to look for commercial and geographical possibilities. In other words, anything that could bring fame or fortune. Unfortunately, we don't even know who was in command or how many men were involved. So what do we know about this Lieutenant Nixon? Not much, I'm afraid, not even a first name or even an initial. But if we look at all the British records for the British Army and the Royal Navy and the Indian Army, we've got something like 28 Lieutenant Nixons in uniform at the time. It's not all that bad, actually, when you think about it, because there's a few things we can do to sort out the sheep from the goats. So you've got to remember that Singapore was actually owned and operated and run by the East India Company, and they had their own army. And that gets rid of the, the British Army fellows and the the Royal Navy lieutenants as well. Within the Indian Army, there were three separate armies, Bombay, Bengal, and Madras. Singapore was garrisoned by the troops from Madras. And within the Madras Army, we've got four Lieutenant Nixons. For those four Lieutenant Nixons, one of them was a pensioner, so we can scratch him off the list. Another one was back in England getting married. That's him gone. The last two were both called Richard Nixon. Whichever Nixon it was, his expedition would have skirted the Arnhem Land escarpment and headed into the dry interior of the Territory. These men were real explorers, moving through unknown country, looking for anything that could make a quid. I'm searching for evidence of Nixon's expedition. Just up ahead here, there's a junction of two creeks, which I reckon's worth having a look at. But on the way, I'll just show you something. What I'm looking for around here, there's one over here, but usually you get some of this mistletoe hanging around here. That's a Mima. And it's got a real survival cycle all of its own, which is fascinating. Here it is here with the little fruit hanging off it. There we go. Really sort of translucent -y, sticky sort of stuff it is. Quite sweet too. But there's a seed in the middle of all this, and what happens is that the birds come along and eat their stuff here, and the seed gets stuck on the end of their beak, so they fly away to a tree and wipe their beak up and down on the branch, dislodge the, the seed again, and bang, up it comes again. The whole cycle repeats itself. There's more mistletoe around here than I've seen for ages. There's been some recent rain, and that's made a big difference. That stuff there, that really typifies what's going on here at the moment. This is the ruby salt bush, and it's called that because of these little red fruit that it gets. Looking a bit like rubies, which you can eat. The really amazing thing about this right now is the, the lush greenness. Normally you get round here, and these things are a sort of a dull, bluey, grey looking colour and all the rest of it, but it's really come alive right now because of this rainfall around the place. Nice and soft and lush, terrific stuff. In fact, looking around the countryside right now, I've never seen it better in all the time that I've been poking through here. For the early explorers, had they known about it, 
Bush Tucker would have been a great asset because surviving out here is tough. You find some funny marks on trees around the place. I think this one here is natural, but 140 years ago, the explorer Augustus Gregory came through and he came to this spot here, junction of two creeks. And what he found here was absolutely amazing. He found the remains of a large camp. Trees like this had all been cut down and ridge poles erected and all that sort of thing. It was pretty old, it was about eight years old, he reckoned. I don't know, I think it might have been a little bit older than that. He looked around the camp, trying to find whose camp it might be, who carved their initials in the side. People like Leichhardt, for instance, did that all the time with all their camps. He looked for animal bones, because people like Leichhardt carted bullocks with them. Couldn't find anything, nothing at all. But he still figured that, well, Leichhardt's the only person who's been through here. Has to be his camp, because no one else had been operating in the area. Well, we know how the Indian Army operates when they do things like this. What they did was they'd move south and they'd establish a depot, a base camp. And from that, they'd radiate out. Then they'd send the rest of the party further down, establish another one, do the same thing again. And what I'm wondering is that perhaps this, that camp that Gregory found, was one of those depots. The one thing we do know is that if Nixon's story is true, then he definitely did pass through this area. From here, Nixon's expedition continued south. They travelled over 800 kilometres in a month, the last part through the Tanami Desert, a hot, flat, featureless place. We don't know what role Lieutenant Nixon played in the expedition, but we do know that one day he climbed a hill, which was later named Mount Singapore by the expedition. I suspect he was up there to get a reading of latitude and longitude using a sextant. But when he looked to the south, he made a remarkable discovery. I'll just read you something from his journal here. May the 15th, 1832. On reaching the summit of the hill, no words can express the astonishment I felt at the magical change of scenery. After having travelled for so many days over nothing but barren hills and parching plains and having to dig for water every day, I saw below me a low and level country through which a broad sheet of water extended. Nixon claims that he saw small boats gliding through a maze of narrow channels and people fishing with nets. On the opposite shore, he could see a cluster of houses in a grove of trees. He reckoned he'd discovered a settlement of 300 Dutch people in the middle of Australia. According to his journal, Nixon and his party stayed eight days and learned about the history and lifestyle of his Dutch descendants. Nixon was the last European to ever see this community. No one knows what became of the Dutch and the remains of their village have never been seen since. The problem lies with Nixon's journal. In it, he noted the latitude and longitude of the hill near the village. But those coordinates meet in this sort of country. There's no permanent water here and no hills. Something's drastically wrong with Nixon's navigation. Lieutenant Nixon would have set his latitude using one of these things here. They're a sextant. And they were designed for use on board ship, where you always had a perfectly flat horizon, no matter where you were in the world. But once you take these things onto land, it's a different story. The ups and downs and heights and all sorts of things. And I think, I think that he forgot that. Because every 150 foot you are in elevation above sea level, you're in fact 12 nautical miles further to the south than what the instrument tells you. I'm just beginning to wonder if he took that into account. And if he didn't, that means I should be looking further to the south down there. 
What fascinates me is that if a Dutch settlement did exist in this vast, lonely place, how on earth did they get there? Where did they come from? Nixon learned that 80 men and 10 women had survived a shipwreck on the West Australian coast. But a shortage of food forced them to move. Apparently, they walked east towards the rising sun. In this part of the country, the only easy way inland is to follow the Fitzroy River. It forms a natural corridor between the rugged Kimberley and the great sandy desert. But can we be sure the Dutch undertook this journey? What evidence is there to say that they may have traveled through this part of Australia? Have a go at this. You see something like this, and it's absolutely mind boggling because clearly this is not Aboriginal. Right here, we're almost 800 kilometres in from the coastline, and yet we can come up to a rock and find an engraving like this. This is not a painting, this is chipped into the rock, and that makes something very special about this because this rock is extremely hard, and to chip at a, a design or a drawing like this into this rock, you've got to have some sort of iron tool or something. It looks almost like a female, sort of medieval type of era. And the face has really got a three-dimensional aspect to it. Who did it? Don't know. But maybe, just maybe, it could be Dutchmen walking inland. This is typical Kimberley country. Lots and lots of rock and spinifex for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And that's horrible stuff to walk through because it's also got the name of porcupine grass for the same reason that it's got all these spikes at the end of each leaf there and they're like needle sharp things that dig into you and sometimes they even break off. So to walk through it would be an extremely painful experience. Imagine Dutch men and women trudging through this sort of country for months on end. What baffles me is that if this story is true, why did the Dutch walk east over a thousand kilometres into unknown country? They had no maps, their supplies were low and water was scarce. Nixon was told many died along the way. Yet, despite these amazing odds, they apparently crossed a final ridge and followed the creek to the large stretch of water that Nixon saw from his Mount Singapore, 170 years later. This little box of tricks here is what you call a GPS, a Global Positioning System. And basically what that does is it talks to satellites, lets me know where I am on the Earth's surface. Handy little bit of kit. Of course, I remember years and years ago when I was a, a digger in the Australian Army, we reckoned that the most dangerous weapon we had was an officer with a map and a compass. And of course, now we're trying to chase Nixon, who was a lieutenant in the Indian Army, and the position he gives us. And who's chasing him? A retired major in the Australian Army. Double jeopardy, that one. Don't like your chances. Anyway, this is his latitude, and it goes all the way through, like this country here, flat, nothing, all the way across to the Stuart Highway. And there is no mountain in there. There's no Mount Singapore, there's no water, nothing. How do I know that? About two years ago, I flew all this country looking for it. Just like this, all the way across. Latitude-wise, I think we've got a bit of a problem. 
This is Nixon's latitude, 18 degrees 30. Either side of it, I've searched a huge area, 60 by 240 kilometers. But I've had no luck finding two specific things, a prominent hill near a large body of water. What I'm interested in now is the creek just to the south of it, around about the 19 degree mark, this one here, Wilson Creek. It's got a bit of permanent water in it, particularly on the eastern end, because there we've got a swamp. And that swamp is rather interesting. Got this air photograph here, taken back in 1972, and you can see that the sand dunes run east-west, but the swamp, the eastern end of it, finishes in a straight line that runs from the northwest to the southeast. And it almost looks to me as if it's been dammed up or walled up or something like that. It's got a bit of an overflow that catches between the sand dunes and then carries on, but almost looks unnatural to me. I've also got another air photo taken way back in 1950, and it's still there then, so it hasn't been man-made in recent times anyway. Whatever it is, I reckon it's worth a good look. This is it. It's what I call hands-on research. Nothing beats actually getting out there. Of course, it's easy for me, exploring from the air, but I can't help thinking about Nixon and his party, pushing through this harsh country, constantly looking for water. As we approach the swamp, I wonder, could this be the spot Nixon reached 160 years ago? From here, the idea of a wall or a dam looks even more convincing than on the air photos. But as we fly lower, something totally unexpected happens. Well, there's that patch of dirt that I thought, on the air photography at least, looked a bit like a mound of earth, but as you can see, it's as flat as a pancake. A bit deceptive, though, because over here on one side we've got high vegetation and right here we've got brown earth poking through. And over there to the east we've got green spinifex grass and the effect of that on a photo makes it look as if this bit in the middle here is jumping up, which of course it's not doing. One thing I can tell you though, this swamp is not the one that Nixon was talking about. Sure enough we've got a mountain back there but it's about eight mile back. You'd never see anything from the top of that down here. But it does show you one thing, here in the desert country you can get big mobs of water, just like this lot here, and exactly the same sort of thing that Nixon was describing. During my long search, I've learned to deal with a lot of disappointment. And at times, it's been a bit discouraging. But as I backtrack through Western Australia, I'm nagged by other things. Things that I've found that support the idea of a lost colony. Nixon's latitude of 18 degrees 30 runs right through the country that belongs to the Warramunga tribe. This tribe was one of a number that the anthropologists Spencer and Gillen studied during the early part of this century. In their notes, I found a couple of interesting things about the Warramunga people. For instance, Warramunga men plucked their facial hair, making their beards quite distinctive. To me, this profile reminds me of a Dutchman from an earlier time. In Warramunga mythology, one particular group of totemic ancestors apparently came from a country across the sea. Now, the Dutch told Nixon that their ancestors were from a distant land across the Great Sea. I have to wonder, were the Warramunga people possibly influenced by Dutch neighbours for 170 years?
In 1851, this Dutch magazine published an article from a harbour master who'd been stationed at the port of Samarang in Java in the 1830s. He recalled a ship arriving from the north coast of Australia. Some of the passengers had travelled inland, where they'd met 300 Dutch people living in a totally primitive manner. I find it so frustrating that the article doesn't mention the name of the ship, how many passengers, or whether there was a Lieutenant Nixon on board. You know, you've really got to ask yourself the question, is this story true? And the number of times I've asked myself that, I hate to think. But when you read the extract from his journal, you can't help but, but be sucked in by it, but believe that it is true because the detail he's put in there, etc., etc., makes it very, very realistic. And one of the things that I really find interesting is that in the beginning, when he first sees these Dutch people, he's very excited. He thinks it's terrific. It's, it's, it's a new civilization for him. But after staying there eight days, all that's changed. And he's quite discontent about the whole thing. He reckons they're mismanagers and uh, ignorant and uh, he wants out of there. He wants to go back to his ship and clear off back to Singapore. We haven't got much to go by. Just one column in a newspaper. But maybe one day we'll find the rest of the journal. And when that happens, we'll be away. Mm -hmm.